Chapter 14, The Challenge I wakened in the huge bed of our Alpha room to find it was morning. Carol and the rest of our Alpha were looking down at me. Welcome back, John, Carol said with a hug. Then everyone was congratulating me. Leah and Raina, along with other nines and tens, had been able to follow my week's activities back in 1976. They observed that I had at last demonstrated love, leadership, and wisdom, the three macro virtues, along with some macro powers, so that my aura was now an emission of fresh lemony orange with tones of pink, purples, greens, blues, and white. I had achieved second-level macro awareness. Later that morning, while I was in my lakeside room at the CI Center, I asked CI to provide me with more information about the levels of awareness. Since this was a general question, I soon discovered that I was receiving a lot more data than I could use or understand. However, by interrupting CI, I asked specific questions, and I was able to gain some of the following information. While it was recognized from the beginning of the macro society back in the 70s that there were 10 general levels of macro awareness, it was not until the year 2025 that anyone demonstrated more than level 3. The levels 8, 9, and 10 were not achieved until after the year 2100, a rather recent development. 2. Because of the relatively low levels of awareness in the early years of the macro society, there had been some regressions in awareness level. This had almost always been associated with the misuse of macro powers or leadership power. Some of these people had been on Micro Island, where they had grabbed power and become the ruling elite. However, in the past 30 years, no one above level 2 had regressed. One could attain a high degree of macro power and still not demonstrate level 2 awareness, since awareness level was determined by the degree of personal evolution or macro awareness, not by the extent of one's macro power. The greatest challenge to the first seven levels of my awareness existed on Micro Island, and thus, my best chance of developing level 3 awareness quickly was to visit there. However, CI pointed out that on Micro Island, I also ran a good chance of losing my second level awareness and regressing to level 1. Figuring that the sooner I got there, the better, I began asking all the questions that I could think of concerning Micro Island. Some of the most important information involved the dangers that I would be facing. Any visitor from the Macro Society was liable to be killed unless protected by Macro Powers. The greatest heroes of Micro Island were those who either killed the Macro Visitors or persuaded them to give up membership in the Macro Society to live permanently on Micro Island. The current leaders of Micro Island were all former members of the Macro Society who had some degree of Macro Powers They used these powers to gain personal fame and fortune. This allowed them to lord it over others on the island. These leaders had been seduced by their desire for power with its fame and adulation. In other words, pride was the last and greatest obstacle to the soul's evolution toward greater awareness. And thirdly, to attain level 3 awareness, I would have to demonstrate a personal evolution level which would overcome this last and greatest micro-trait, pride. To do this, I would have to voluntarily relinquish the protection of the macro-society with all its high-level members, including Leah and Reina. I questioned CI extensively on this last bit of information and was finally given the analogy that if I wanted to demonstrate swimming proficiency, I wouldn't wear a life jacket. From this, I concluded that if I let anyone else help me overcome pride, I would not be demonstrating level 3 awareness. The thought of being attacked by the inhabitants of Micro Island didn't seem so frightening since my experience with Griffin Judd. However, if I was attacked by someone who had developed macro powers as great or greater than my own, that would be something else. That evening, I talked over this last possibility with Carol and Raina and received some very disturbing news. It seemed that the leaders of Micro Island were expecting me. How could they expect me? I asked Raina. I've never visited Micro Island. You've been told, she answered, that the leaders of Micro Island are former members of the Macro Society, some of whom have highly developed macro powers. With telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition, they learned a great deal about you. And, Carol added, they are determined to either kill you or persuade you to give up the macro way of life. But why should they especially be interested in me? I asked. Because, Raina answered, they know that you're a twin soul of Leah, who, with the help of other nines and tens, has managed our first time space translation. They would like to destroy our project by killing you, or, even better, by getting you to denounce the macro society and join them on Micro Island. That's ridiculous, I said. They must know that if I joined them, I couldn't attain level 3 awareness and would lose my chance of permanent time translation. Raina gave me a long, appraising look before she answered. 
Finally, she said, there is another way of staying here permanently. Since Leah and the rest of us have established the time translation, as long as you are in 2150 time, they could complete the translation if you would cooperate with them. But, but that's impossible, I exclaimed. See, I told me that no one above level 7 has ever defected to Micro Island. They wouldn't have the power, the macro power. I was shocked to see both Rena and Carol shaking their heads in disagreement with my statement. Then Rena said, There are over a thousand former macro society members on Micro Island with varying degrees of macro power. When they form a mind net in which all of them link their minds together, they could exert enough psychic power to complete, with your help, the time-space translation. However, while you would be a permanent member of 2150, it would also have been accomplished without the help of your twin soul before you reached the psychic balance of level 3 personal evolution. My God, I exclaimed, then they can offer 2150 without my having to attain level 3. Raina nodded. And they are planning to offer you not only permanent translation to 2150, but also adoption into their ruling elite, making you the third most powerful person on Micro Island. Yes, Carol added, you would rank just below their president, Elgon, and their vice president, Sela. Elgon was the only level 7 in the macro society who ever regressed levels. It made him so angry that he chose to leave macro society some 80 years ago and make himself president of Micro Island. Ten years later, he managed to persuade his former alpha mate, Sela, who had been a level 6, to join him as his vice president. But how is it, I ask, that they can permanently complete my time translation when the combined efforts of every 9 and 10 here and in the nearby planets is unable to do the same thing? Oh, they could do it, all right, Carol answered calmly, but they choose not to until you demonstrate level 3 awareness. Now wait a minute, I said. Do I understand you correctly that the macro society has the power to keep me here permanently right now but won't do it because they don't like my level of awareness? Precisely, Raina answered, but not because we're snobbish over levels of awareness, as you are presently suspecting. Well, then what is the reason that you won't let me become a permanent member unless I attain level 3 awareness? I asked a bit miffed. We believe, Raina said, that if we completed the time translation before you had attained the psychic balance of at least level 3, you would not be able to withstand the micro pressures and would quickly regress to level one and eventually choose to live permanently on Micro Island. Are you sure? I asked. No, Rinda answered candidly, and we are not sure that even at level three you won't regress and eventually choose to leave the macro society, but we all agree that we'll take that gamble. I learned from CI, Carol added, that almost a third of the level tens advised not completing the time translation until you had reached level seven. That was before they learned that Leah could only hold you here for three months without completing the time translation. I felt cold and clammy with a combination of understanding and frustration. What was the minimum level of awareness that you had agreed on before you learned of the time limitation? Level five, Carol replied. For a moment I just stared at the two of them while I let this chilling information register completely in my mind. So you're telling me that even with level 3 awareness, the odds are against my continuing to expand my awareness in 2150? That's true, John, Raina replied. Many feel your future success in macro society is very doubtful due to the fact that you weren't born and raised in this age. Many feel that three months of your time is not enough to overcome the pull of your micro past. But we have voted and agreed to give you the chance if your personal evolution reaches level 3. Now it was my turn to give Raina a long, appraising stare. Finally, I said, with your level 10 wisdom and your precognitive powers, what do you see in my future? She smiled and answered, things about the future can only be known as probabilities or as possibilities, and they are always subject to change by the altering state of one's desire and belief. It would be unwise to predict your future at this point. I'll be happy to help you explore alternative possibilities, though. I shook my head, saying, I still don't understand why anyone would think that I would give up my twin soul, Leah, Carol, my Alpha, you, and the whole macro society to permanently join a micro society. After all, I've lived in a micro society for 27 years back in 1976, and I know firsthand how miserably neurotic and selfish it is. The advantage of a micro society, Rena answered, is that you can indulge your selfish desires and be acclaimed as a patriot, a statesman, or a hero in some field of endeavor. Carol shook my hand. Then, looking at me with great intensity, she said, But I believe in you, John. I know that you'll overcome the micro-self. 
and i too believe in you raina added it was my statement of belief in you before the council of tens that persuaded them to accept a level three demonstration then i was startled to telepathically hear leah saying and i believe in you always and forever carol and raina smiled at me and i knew that they too had picked up leah's message raina said certainly the three of us who know you best ought to be able to provide you with enough belief to overcome your micro doubts i replied as long as i provide the necessary desire and thought of losing contact with the three of you certainly provides me with the motivation i need very well carol said now the only question that remains is when should we leave for micro island tomorrow i answered raina stretched out her hand to me and said i strongly suggest that you wait one more week in which you can continue developing your macro powers i feel you'll need all that you can develop do you get that precognitively i asked no she laughed i get it logically all right i agreed we'll wait one more week and i'll do all i can to develop my macro powers but that only gives me a little over two weeks to either attain level three or say farewell to twenty one fifty for the next week i played endless rounds of pk tennis with carol neil and jean we played some more 2150 chess, too, and an extremely helpful new learning game called Merge. The object of this new game was to become one with the object, animal, person, or action, to feel what it feels the way it feels it, to sense what it senses, to move as it moves, to know what it knows, to merge with it, and to be it for a while. What an awakening experience, and what fun, too. The hardest part was always giving up my selfhood. Through hard practice and taking the necessary risks, I eventually learned that I never really had a selfhood in the first place, except from a micro view. I learned that you can't lose what you never really had in the first place, namely yourself. Since your separateness is only an illusion created by choice, it is there whenever you think you want it or need it. You can't possibly be lost or taken away from you. People are fascinating to merge with, but also the most difficult and most educational and the most painful. Objects are the most dangerous for adults. While children find life so exciting that they jump from adventure to adventure, adults sometimes weary of the challenges and risks of life. If in this weary state they merge with, say, a huge oak or a lovely old big stable rock, it's extremely difficult sometimes for them to want to come back out. And since desire precedes action, one must want to be a person more than he wants to be an oak before he can come back out of the oak and be fully a person. Back in 1976, I visited hospitals to practice healing. I used not only PK, but also clairvoyance, telepathy, and the beginnings of precognition and my newly developed ability to merge. As I walked up and down the hospital corridors, if I saw a future, that is, if I future saw, the possibility of death coming quickly for a patient, I would try to remove this possibility. Interestingly, in attempting this, I discovered the truth of free choice. One afternoon, I persuaded, with considerable telepathic effort, the head nurse and two interns that I should be allowed access to the intensive care unit where I found Bruno. He was a small man of 45 years who was recovering from a heart attack of that morning. According to the intern who examined him, he was coming along just fine. But as I examined him clairvoyantly, his aura was extremely weak, and I future saw him riding in a hearse while lying in a casket. Since both these symbols represented death, I felt that I had better go to work on Bruno immediately. The moment I made contact, I got a quite a surprise. Bruno had been lying quietly, sleeping while I clairvoyantly examined him. But now, as I reached out and touched his mind, I heard him say, Hello, Azar. It's been a long time since our paths have crossed. Azar is the name that I had in an Atlantean incarnation almost 50,000 years ago. I had been a temple priest in charge of healing. Now that I had been addressed by that ancient name, I felt strongly that the mind I was in contact with had once occupied a body which I helped heal during that Atlantean incarnation. I said, it seems that I remember you from a period in Atlantis which we shared, but how did you remember me so easily? With the conscious Bruno still sleeping, I heard his subconscious mind saying, if I were awake, I would have no conscious memory of you. However, with my conscious mind asleep, I have been free to observe ever since you entered this ward and began using telepathy to hypnotically persuade the intern to let you accompany him. I watched as you clairvoyantly examined some of the patients, and I remembered that your mind had once been clothed in a body called Azar and had healed me. I wasn't aware that I was being observed, I said. I know, Bruno answered. 
your conscious mind is still extremely limited compared to your macro potential. But, I ask puzzled, how do you know about the macro potential? Because, dear old friend, another cell of my soul is presently experiencing a life in 2150, which you so often visit. Yet another is deeply involved in establishing the separate culture on Micro Island. It needs to experience power and practice using it properly. By 2085, it will be dead, though, he went on. Wait a minute, I stopped him. You're here in 1976. You haven't made it to 2000 yet, much less beyond. No, Azar. It's you who have not yet gone beyond. I guess you've not yet truly incorporated the concept of simultaneous time into your growth pattern. Incidentally, I picked up from your mind your plan of attempting to prevent my evolution, which I'm not going to let you do. I appreciated your help last time, but this time I don't want it. You mean that you don't want to live anymore, that you're choosing to die? That's right, he answered, and you find a quite a few other minds in this hospital who are ready to give up their bodies. But why, I ask, you've only lived a relatively short time, you must have a family who will miss you. Telepathically, I heard him laugh and say, when I incarnated 45 years ago, I promised myself that I would accomplish my purpose as quickly as possible and then evolate. I've already stayed longer than I had planned. May I ask you what your purpose was? I inquired. Well, I wanted to balance my vibrations. First, I chose to be born to a woman who, in my 21st century life, I will probably marry and abandon. In this life, as her son, I treated her kindly and have taken care of her for the last 20 years since her husband died. Six months ago, she followed him. Well, how can you balance negative vibrations you won't even create till 50 years in the future? I wondered if his mind was deteriorating too. You'll find, Azar, that the past, present, and future are all micro terms, illusions which do not exist from a macro view. All time is simultaneous. Getting on with my answer to your first question, I was a jealous, possessive wife and made my husband's life a living hell. Now, for 25 years, I have been married to a woman who has done the same for me. My two children are grown and married, and I leave my wife financially well off, so now I can evolate, having completed my chosen learning experience. But now that you've accomplished your purpose, I said, why don't you stay around for a while and enjoy life? Again, the sound of laughter echoed through my mind, and he said, I go to a far better place than this planet Earth will ever be. I invite you to visit me when you perfect your astral traveling enough that you can visit some of the non-physical dimensions. Bye for now. Bruno's body convulsed. His lids snapped sharply open. Only the after-death tremors lingered. He had evolated. My whole being felt an instant of icy hollowness as I saw, staring up from me, from this lifeless face, Nancy's liquid brown eyes. Later in 2150, Raina explained that every human mind chooses when it wants to die. This choice, she explained, is not usually made on the conscious level, but rather on the subconscious or soul level. During the rest of the week, I discovered that Bruno had been correct when he predicted that many other minds would refuse my offer to help heal their bodies. I was surprised at how many minds insisted on the value of suffering. I remember a middle-aged woman who was seriously afflicted with arthritis, when I offered to help her subconscious mind, replied, Please don't remove my pain, for it is the motivation that will eventually force my micro-self to give up its narrow, selfish life habits, which have psychologically crippled others, and which are now crippling me. If you remove the pain, I will have to start my lesson over, and I'd rather grow now. I realized that this woman had never consciously permitted herself to be aware of these thoughts, if she could have heard her subconscious mind talking to me, she would have denied that this was her own greater self talking. When I asked her if she couldn't learn in some less painful way, she replied, I've not yet learned to accept responsibility for the harm I've done to others, so I keep taking the same old life lessons over and over. Eventually, the pain will force me to break this it's-not-my-fault cycle. Then I can admit my failure, forgive it, learn from it, and overcome it. It's been a long battle, but victory will come. When I asked Raina about having to forgive yourself, she explained forgiveness as acceptance. She said that when you forgive yourself, you positively accept your mistakes and, thus, can learn to succeed and grow from them. However, negative acceptance, resignation, leaves one burdened with guilt until it becomes necessary to escape by inducing amnesia. It's then impossible not to make the same mistake over and over again. She was talking about the law of love, which transcends the law of karma. 
Only by completely responding to ourselves with loving acceptance can we look at all of the aspects of the self, which includes not only the micro-self, but also the macro-self. And we can only see in others what we can see in ourselves, even if only potential. And we can only love, that is, accept others to the extent that we can love, accept ourselves. It wasn't until I had examined every person in our university hospital that I accepted Raina's statement that all illness and injury is self-inflicted. I discovered that I could heal no one unless I could first persuade him to forgive himself. Yet I did find quite a few patients who were ready to forgive themselves. All these healed in record time, causing considerable consternation among the hospital personnel. Human consternation, I have found, is always the result of a myth being threatened. Since I had brought my journal up to date, Carl and Nada were becoming increasingly concerned about my forthcoming visit to Micro Island. Carl kept quoting passages that strengthened his warnings about the dangers involved, and I kept quoting passages that strengthened my resolve to go. Nada insisted that I would succeed and that there was no reason to worry about me. Finally, it was obvious even to Nada that her constant assurances that I would succeed were an unfailing indication that she feared the opposite. Fortunately, Griffin Judd visited us regularly and kept her occupied. Both were sincerely trying to live a new lifestyle. They had quit their motorcycle gang and had taken jobs, Judd at an auto repair shop and Griff with a construction company. They were deeply interested in my further experiences in 2150. At last, the week ended, and early one morning, Carol and I said goodbye to our Alpha and Beta and most of our Gamma and began to run to the building at the end of the lake. As we passed each gamma, I saw more people than I had ever seen before in 2150, for almost everyone had turned out to send both vocal and telepathic messages to support us. As we approached the large administration building, we could see the rest of our delta gathered around our trance air. I was moved by the tremendous outpouring of loving acceptance that many macro beings could produce. As we made our way to the vehicle, I saw standing beside it Raina, Eli, and my beloved Leah. I ran to embrace Leah. We stood in complete silence, with no one in the crowd making a sound as we fitted our minds into a union that only twin souls can ever attain. To me, she was the most exquisitely lovely, completely satisfying woman who had ever lived. Overcome by my feelings, and with tears on my face, I kissed her gently. Then, taking my face in her hands, she kissed me. It was the most enlightening kiss my soul had known since incarnating in matter. Then Leah turned, touched Carol's face, and disappeared into the crowd. I shook hands with Hugo, our Deltar, and Eli, our Katar. I remembered seeing him when I met my Alpha members, then in his astral body, as he visited his Katan. But I still had not spent further time with him, as I had so long to do. I was convinced that I had never beheld such a handsome and wise-looking man before. He took my hands, then embraced me firmly. He looked deep into my eyes for a long time and said, You never asked, so at Raina's request, no one ever told you. But the woman who was your P.E. tutor is also our Mutar. She is thus a member of the Council of Three. I must have looked strange, for I know my breath was gone, as I remembered C.I. telling me that the Council of Three, which consisted of the three Mutars, that is, leaders of one hundred million, was composed of two men and one woman, whose decisions were binding on all members of the macro society. I was stunned to learn that my very own tutor, Raina, was that one woman. No wonder her advocacy of level three entrance for me had been accepted. I looked at her with awe and a new sense of restraint. She came over to me and took my hand, saying, Now you know why I hoped you would not learn of my other duties. We who have grown up in the macro society do not feel awe or a sense of distance between us and our leaders, but I know that you were trained differently. I found it difficult to say anything, but managed rather lamely. Will you still be my tutor when I get back from Micro Island? She said with a smile, I will be your tutor as long as you both desire it and believe it possible. Carol and I walked into our trance air and set the ceiling doors in motion. Eli stepped out from the crowd. In my mind, his rich, full voice rang, as though through a great hall. Thank you for your admiration, John. Know that it is returned. You should also know that during your twentieth century, a soul made a brief sojourn, just thirty years, for the solitary purpose of bearing a child. 
Having many other duties to tend to, she stayed just long enough to see her young son securely entrusted to the loving care of a soul you now know as Carl Johnson. The doors met. We melded together. And as we took off, I could hear Eli answering my unspoken question. For what strength it may give you, my beloved son, I am your mother.' 